she didn't die because she was a Catholic. Mm. She died because she was, by heredity anyway, mm. if not by practice or by belief, she was a Jew. Mm. Yes, I tend to agree, I think. Um, but saying that, Detty did have certainly saintly attributes, you could say. I mean, she was deeply altruistic, um, n naturally so, I believe. And, and Yang Garland's introduction, of course, um, beautifully uh, describes this side of her. Um, in fact, I'm sure Etty Hillison would have, had no, would have had absolutely no idea we would be speaking of her virtues 60 years on. Um, yet, you know, she, the, the last two years of her life or so, she really did um, uh, use the majority of her energies to, to help her um, friends and family and those in, the, in Wester Bork and, and the, the um, holding camps. Um, this this very giving nature and, uh, and truly altruist, altruistic um, uh, personality, I think, shone through, didn't it? So, uh, I think her virtues absolutely shine through out of her writings, and she clearly was highly devoted to fellow Jews in Vesterbork and tried to get help her family and her friends. And I mean, you know, the tr one of the tragedies of it all, and it's a huge family tragedy when you read of them, I'm quite apart from much bigger tragedy, but the family tragedy is that you know nobody survived one brother survived mm. made it to the very end of the war to mm. bergen belsen and died on his journey back to holland and you just think you know so so nobody was left and i think that was quite common but that we've got her diaries and that mm. it's you know it is of the time mm. and that she knew in some sense that she she knew completely i think that she wasn't coming back mm. and then made sure that her diaries survived although then it took so long for her diaries to be published mm. and cleaned up and published and now in many languages um, I think it's terrific that we can read her diaries nearly 70 years after her death mm. I think the sadness for me is I suspect that there were many other people yes. keeping diaries mm. many other people who maybe have been as altruistic and plenty who were absolutely I'm nothing sure. like <laughs> as altruistic as she was but well. <laughs> other people who were really wonderful sure. and we know nothing about no. them and I think one of the things that I feel so strongly about this diary, why I feel, why I love it so much, mm. is it's it's obviously very much a personal thing and about her, but it's also a monument actually to the strength of the human spirit in a mm. much more general way. And I really love that, and mm. I think it's really important that people read it. Mm. And I think it's important that people read it as much as they read, you know, the diary of Anne Frank, which everybody knows. Mm. I think this is of a, a different order, and obviously she was much older and much more sophisticated. And I think people ought to read it. Mm. It's interesting you should um, make that um, comparison because, of course, Anne Frank's diary, I actually read it, uh, I think, at um, a similar age to this diary. And um, both uh, were incredibly sophisticated women, actually. Anne Frank, for her age, incredibly sophisticated. But, of course, um, Etty Hillison, being uh, a good decade or so older, did have um, a number of hormones, <laughs> I'm sure, running through her system that um, Anne Frank didn't. And, of course, she had um, all these rather complex relationships with, with the men, which we won't go into because it's probably not necessarily spiritually um, uh, relevant, but um, for this, but unless you feel it is. I, didn't no. so. <laughs> um, I, on a more, I don't know um, how recently you've, you've read the text, um, but um, when I was reading the text um, through on a more analytical uh, level, it seemed to me that her writing is, of course, so beautiful and poetic and very philosophical throughout. Um, and, of course, nearer the end, it becomes very clear through the actual use of her language, it becomes somehow less coherent and, and fragmented somehow, and, and you can sense her real depression and anxiety and, and fear. Um, but there is one excerpt nearer the end in 1943, um, an excerpt, um, excerpt she writes, which... Um, I found very profound and um, seemed to um, illuminate itself for me somehow and which caught my attention. And she writes, some, some people are born into this world with a soul 15 years old and others hundreds. Uh, mine feels thousands years old. I feel as though I've been here a thousand times before. I found this extremely interesting <laughs> as a comment. and. Um, uh, as I say, in fact, I, I mentioned to you a little earlier that we belong to a, a study society where P.D. Ospensky taught, and, and um, of course, his um, school of thought, um, which it, it's not so much um, a bit too noisy, <laughs> sorry, no, um, perhaps isn't so relevant to Judaism. 
but um, the yeah. whole idea of um, uh, eternal recurrence, not so much reincarnation, but that whole sense of um, really having a soul that can um, develop, you know, a, a, and is almost predestined in the sense you're born with a, a, a developed uh, essence and, and character, as it were. And do you believe in any of that as no. such? No, I don't believe in any of that. <laughs> and I don't think that's what she was saying. No, okay. um, I mean, I think I take a much more a particular view of it. And I think that what she was saying when she thought she'd been there a thousand times before mm. was actually a reflection on what happens to the Jews mm. and that persecution of no, the Jews had happened over mm. many, many, mm. many hundreds of years in many different mm. ways. And actually, I, I, I think you're right when you say that the tone changes completely, I think, towards the end of the 1943 sections. I, she's in vestibule. She's not going back to Amsterdam anymore. The conditions are getting worse. They're constantly in the mud. People are ill. It's really horrible. She feels this is about persecution. She thinks the guards are beasts. She's beginning to be really quite nasty about the Germans, which she isn't much earlier on. And I think she's reflecting on what it means to be Jewish. And mm. I think it's about this is where Jews have been. She knew about, after all, she knew about pogroms. Her mother had actually come, fled from a pogrom in Russia, as far as we know. And uh, I think this is about, you know, this has happened thousands of times before. I'm not sure it's the same kind of reflection on the nature of the soul at all. Mm. I think it's much more a reflection on the nature of the human, and in this case, Jewish, Jewish. condition. Mm. And I think it's really important because what changes in her tone is it becomes sort of staccato mm. uh, and much less lyrical. Mm. And it's staccato. You also feel it's almost like gunshot. Mm. And um, I think that's what she was hearing. I think a lot of what comes out at the end is a reflection on what she's hearing, what's all around her, and her own, I think, not inconsiderable fear, mm. although that's not what she really mm. reflects in her writing. But you know, I don't think people were in Vestibulg without being afraid. Mm. It was a question of when you were going to be deported, not whether you were mm. going to be. And so it was always, you know, when is it going to be my turn? Mm. Yes, and it's interesting that, as you say, when she comments on, on being into this world, she felt, you know, she was born in, into this world a thousand years, or at least she's been there a thousand years, yeah. um, a thousand times before. In fact, it's interesting that she, as I'm sure many other Jews, probably felt more and more Jewish and identified themselves as being more and more Jewish. The fact that they were, the, their whole community was um, suffering perhaps t in, in, in this way? Or I think it's more complicated than... Um, just identifying them more and more Jewishly. They're forced to identify mm. more and more Jewishly because increasingly they have no contact with people who aren't Jewish. Mm. Of course, one of the things that would have been true for Etty Hillesum and many other people is that they would have been forced into Vesterborg and into very, very tight space. I mean, the mm. place was built originally for German Jews coming across the border into Holland. Mm. It was built for, say, 1,500, 2,000 people, and they, you know, they had 40, 50,000 more in there. Um, I think it was more about you were forced to associate and be at very close quarters with, mm. far closer than one would normally want to in terms of one's personal space, with Jews who were very different. Mm. You know, Jews who came from Eastern Europe, very, very different traditions, much more observant Jews, or people who are much less observant or whatever. You didn't have a choice but to identify as Jewish. Mm. So you began to sort of say to yourself, well, what does this mean? And I think some of, some of that, and I think you get that earlier in her writing, earlier in 43, is some of it, you know, what does this all mean? Mm. What does it mean to be part of this community of which I only feel wholly, a, you know, mm. half a part? Mm. I don't feel wholly a part, and yet she was working for the Jewish Council, a job that she'd got through some kind of connections anyway, mm. because otherwise, you know, many of them didn't have jobs at all, any mm. means of any mm. means of sustenance. Mm. And um, it, psychologically, I, I think it's very interesting that not that I understand much of the history of the Second World War, but of course, Hitler and the Nazi Party, of course, stigma stigmatized the, the Jewish people first of all, um, claiming they were amoral, immoral, and also mentally unwell in many cases, or at least they tend to, to categorize the Jewish people in that light in order to perhaps begin their ethnic, ethnic cleansing. Do you believe that had there been other minority groups in Europe at that point in time, in, uh, including Holland, that um, they would have had a similar fate to the Jewish community? Well, other minority mm. groups did, and yeah, particularly yeah. lots of the Slavs, not in Holland, mm. but Slavs had a very rough time. Mm. Um, you know, the, the gypsies, the Roma, yes. I mean, they were exterminated in the yes. same way. And, you know, you, you, we shouldn't forget, they're not ethnic groups, obviously, but you shouldn't forget homosexuals and yes. left-wingers. <clears throat> My mother was a German refugee, 
and she was a communist before before the war in Germany, as well as being Jewish. And we used to tease her in a way and say, you know, come on, Mum, it's careless to be both. But, of course, it was very common. Lots of people were not only one of those groups that the Nazis chose to hate. Um, and I think that... Had there been, I mean, other, I mean, the Roma were persecuted in, in, in Holland. It wasn't a huge Roma community, but I mean, the Roma community in the, what's now the Czech Republic were hugely persecuted by the Nazis and, of course, are yet again being persecuted. Mm. When you research any part of history, um, there's um, an awful amount of um, bogus information out there are websites that really don't know the facts and um, you know the world world war one we lost um, tragically about 35 million there were 35 million casualties and over 15 million um, deaths and from what research I've tried to do world war two if is it right 60 million near 70 million people um, were killed during the war, uh, six million of which were, Jew were Jews. Or is that off track slightly? That sounds pretty off track to me, but I don't know the figures for certain. I wouldn't be absolutely certain about that. Um, that sounds huge to me. Well, Particularly I don't as military injuries were, far da were think, vastly down on I the First think, World uh, War. Um, so it's, civ it's all civilian. I think civilian and, and uh, military were uh, twen sorry, 20, 000, 20 million were um, military, 30 million were pedestrian, or at least another 10 million on top of that. Roughly speaking, I don't know how they kept tags on, yeah, how would you, how could you? Um, but, um, I'd be amazed if it was the highest 20 million military. But I military. think what many people wouldn't realise that, of course, the majority, in fact, um, the majority of people who actually uh, um, perished because of World War II was because of post-war flu and famine um, but of course it's very difficult to, to know exactly those figures because I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I can comment on no. that in, in and this again the flu was after the first world the flu was that's after true, the first world that's war that's what tends to happen with world wars sadly but no no, no the, the flu was much worse after the first world war yes. that's absolutely huge yes. the Spanish flu epidemic yes. killed more people than yeah. the, the war yeah. had killed so um, I don't th I don't think we can go there yeah. really that's fine I was just more for my own no. peace of mind I was trying to figure out I don't think and I don't think the figures are right no Perhaps not. Well, this was on Wikipedia. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think it's shocking, wrong. Isn't it? I think that's taking in people, you know, who were starving in mm. Stalin's Russia, which actually wasn't about the war. True, yeah. that's true. Actually, um, funny, because I don't know if they included <laughs> the Russian figures. Well, you're talking about famine, that's what it was. Mm. Um, I think this is purely Europe. Um, oh, um, all right, so two more questions. And uh, I don't know, how, much, how many more questions do you think we'll need to bump it up? For Depends how how short they are okay it? i'll yeah. do my best sorry <laughs> tight yeah. tight okay um uh first question it's um i found it extremely shocking to learn uh that um really during the first couple of years of the second world war um and from the point where the jewish people began their transportation to or were transported to the extermination camps from that point on where the torture became really truly grim um, letters were being sent to the allies from within these camps in desperation to for, for the um, to asking for them to be bombed and for the camps to be bombed and yet the allies di didn't act upon any of the, these requests and um, of course in in one sense quite rightly you know, they didn't want to align themselves with a world war. Wo a world war. Um, on the other hand, from a moral point of view, what do you feel about their attitude there? There's a great deal of evidence that people escaped from extermination camps and that they certainly were sending letters and all sorts of communications out of holding camps and concentration camps that reached the Allied forces, that reached people in command, saying, please bomb these camps, please bomb the railway lines to Auschwitz uh, to stop this happening, to, 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 you know, at least to delay some of the extermination. Mm. And I think the view of the Allies, and it looks reprehensible to us, but I think the view of the Allies at the time was, this isn't part of the war effort, mm. this isn't what it's about. And I, I look at it and think this is truly, truly ghastly, if you had been in charge of a war effort where you were running out of cash and you were running out of munitions and you were just saying, you know, we want to beat the bastards, 
you can see how that decision was taken. And so I think it's really difficult from the vantage point that we're at to say they got it completely wrong. Because although they knew these things were happening, they certainly won't have known the extent of it, because nobody, other than presumably the Nazis, knew the extent of it. And also they had something else that they were trying to do, was to beat the people who were in charge of making this happen. And so they must have taken, and it would have been a tactical decision, they must have taken a tactical decision that the thing they needed to use all their resources on was beating the Germans. It doesn't seem to me right um, to criticise them as loudly as some people have, for doing that. It's very difficult to tell what it would have felt like if one had been in their position at the time. It wasn't that they said, you know, who gives us stuff about the Jews, although a few people did do that, but that was not the majority thing. The majority thing is, you know, what we try to do, we're trying to do the war effort. This isn't part of the war effort. Nobody thought, I think what's important is that nobody thought that the Germans were as completely committed to this extermination program as they emerged, out, emerged to be. So people heard about extermination, but they didn't realize the scale. But even if they had, would they have done something? Have we done much to stop the absolute horrors going on in Zimbabwe? Now, many of us feel that things should be done to stop the horrors that are going on in Zimbabwe. But another view would be, actually, you want to make the, the situation for the Zimbabwean government impossible, and there are other and diplomatic ways of doing that. So I think this is always a very, very difficult one to argue, and particularly, I think, to argue in retrospect. Um, yes. It may not be what you want to no, hear. No, no, I think, I, I think, you know, think no, I'm right. learning. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, my sense of history is, you know, um, <laughs> I've been busy researching, but it's, uh, it's fascinating. Though. And um, A lot of Jews would, di would, would disagree, disagree with me. Yeah. They would agree with but you. But it is, as you say. It's, um, but it, that wasn't how it was at the time. No. Um, oh, actually, I th there is something I could say here which might be useful. My father mm. volunteered and fought in the army in the Second World War, as did one of his brothers. And I remember talking to them about this, because there was a great deal of material about how uh, Churchill himself and how the sort of, you know, the war office had been made aware of what was going on. And I remember him saying, you know, he wasn't sure, had he been in their position, however terrible he felt about it all, however much members of his family were in concentration camp and he got his uncle out of concentration camp, he wasn't sure that had he been in their position, he would have used rare and precious resources to do that when what he wanted to do was to beat the Germans. And he was actually fighting as a Jew. In which country was he based? He was, in British, he, was, he? he was fighting in the British Army. My father, my father was born in Britain. Yes. So, um, I'm not sure, again, my sense of history, but... Um, at should, the I very say, should I do that again and just say put it in the British Army? Um, that yes. Is, that would uh, I think yeah. it was make quite clear, yeah. yeah. So I was just thinking that yeah. would make the editing easier. <laughs> OK, so I think there is another point that's worth making, which is that my father, who was born and bred in Britain and whose parents originally born in Germany had tried to turn him into an English gentleman, um, he volunteered and fought in the British Army as a professing Jew. And... When all this stuff first came out about um, how, you know, quite a lot of evidence had reached the war office, had reached Churchill himself, about the, uh, you know, the, what was going on in the, in the extermination camps, I remember him saying, reflecting on this, and as personally feeling very strongly that they should have done something, nevertheless saying, but if I had been in the war office at the time, would I have wanted to divert the resources, the precious resources that I had at my disposal to stop the extermination of the Jews when what I was really trying to do was to defeat, defeat the Germans who were causing this in the first place? And I think that's quite a difficult question. No, it's, yes. And... Um, is it true that at the start of the world, uh, world War II, though, that uh, Britain really was more or less allied with, very nearly anyway, with Hitler, and it w we became very near to um, signing treaties, you know, whereby you know, Hitler actually saw us as an Aryan race, first of all, and also um, part of his imper imperialist... In the late 1930s, Chamberlain was very near signing a deal with Hitler, and that was very much disapproved of by a large chunk of the population. I think it is really important to know that when Chamberlain was going towards, you know, this kind of Munich Treaty and all of that, that what actually was going on was that he was doing something with quite a lot of feeling in the general public that they were not sympathetic, that they were not sympathetic to this. And there are 
various reasons that they weren't sympathetic to it. First of all, there were quite a lot of people quite shocked by what they'd seen with the Olympics in Germany in 1936. And secondly, and importantly, they'd fought the Hun in their terms in the First World War, and they didn't really see why they should be allied with them now. And I think it's very difficult, again, it's very difficult in hindsight to see what it must have felt like at the time. But there was quite strong popular resistance to the idea of a pact with Hitler. On the other hand, there was also quite a strong desire not to go through another world war, because the first world war had been so absolutely devastating. I mean, not a family in the land had remained untouched, had not lost somebody either within the First World War or to the, in the enormous Spanish flu epidemic that was immediately afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we need to move away from the history. It's, it's giving me brain ache. It's fascinating, though. I could um, do one more. One more question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, this is um, interesting. Um, I should just um, mention, of course, we mentioned, of course, um, even now in, in current day news and broadcast, um, we don't hear much of what's going on, uh, much of the suffering <laughs> on a worldwide scale. You know, what, as you said, what's happening in Zimbabwe, Somalia, and such forth. Um, the World Service, and, and well, I shouldn't say that to, to not sound critical, but you know, um, what's in the news currently is what what people tend to to um, uh, have on their their conscious minds, and. Um, in fact, it is interesting. I think it's halfway through this diary in 1942, spring 1942. I think Etty hears, uh, ironically enough, it's a World Service uh, broadcast um, announcing the numbers that are perishing in the in the death camps. Yet, of course, it, g it gives no further details. Of course, it doesn't uh, mention the torture and the, the abom abominations that are taking place. Um, this isn't really a question. This is simply, I just wondered Come if you wanted to question. add if you wanted to add any more to to, to that point, really, um, to the. Uh, by 1942, people knew that extermination camps were in place. Uh, I don't think for one single moment, whether you listen to the broadcasts or whatever, that anybody who was close to what was going on in even the holding camps, like Vesterburg, mm. would have been in any doubt about the torture and the ill-treatment and the appalling things. But, you know, it, again, it's a very strange thing to say. I think that the torture and the ill-treatment and so on were pretty well known. I think people did know quite a lot about that. But the thing that really shocked people, really, really shocked people immediately after the war and seeing the newsreels, you can watch the newsreels now, was just the enormous number of dead. Oddly, Whatever we know about the torture, whatever we know about the appalling things that people do to one another, and you know, torture is not a particularly Nazi invention, um, it's the, the piles of dead and rotting corpses that really shocked people. And the people who, you know, the British soldiers who liberated Belson, I mean, there's still some of them alive now who will tell you about how they still, if they think about it, they still feel absolutely sick. And so however terrible the knowledge of the torture and the ill-treatment, it's in the end, I think it is that the huge numbers of dead uh, and the way that so many of them starved to death, actually, in the end, uh, that, that really, really shocked. And it is huge numbers. I mean, six million is a huge, huge number. Was it, out of interest, was it the, the um, British soldiers and the Allies who took these photographs or was it the 